Howdy y'all, welcome back. Today we're going to try to entertain an argument, just a theory, that the great blood described in the biblical text could have genuinely occurred, and furthermore, that this great blood could have occurred in what is today the United States of America. In doing this research, the one thing which I believe must also be included in this discussion is the Great Salt Lake and Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm going to throw out what are agreed upon current narrative facts, names, and numbers regarding this history, hoping to elicit the connections necessary to allow us to at least begin to understand the true nature of ancient Western America. First, when peering in the history of Salt Lake City and the Great Salt Lake, nearly every source appears to have been watered down in one way or another. Most of the historical narratives begin with the founding of the city by the Latter-day Saints in 1847, with almost no mention of the thousands of years of earlier indigenous history. Which leads us very nicely into the first aspect of the narrative, which begs a deeper dive. Who really knew about Salt Lake City when it was founded, and how much of the current narrative can be proven accurate? Some may say that the Latter-day Saints lucked upon the Great Salt Lake in 1847, having only a simple understanding of exactly the landscape which they were looking to discover and then settle upon. Still, others claim by 1847, the Great Salt Lake was well known amongst certain circles. This is where we have our first conflict in the narrative. Salt Lake City did not officially exist in 1845, yet at this time, we're told Lansford Hastings traveled to California in the fall of 1845, landing in Alta, California, lodging at Sutter's Fort, and spending the winter there. Hastings' path took him north of what is today the state of Utah. However, at Sutter's Fort in 1845, Hastings met John C. Fremont, who had himself just explored the Great Salt Lake Desert. Upon hearing of the possibility of a much faster path to the south of the Great Salt Lake, Hastings developed the Hastings Cutoff, an alternate route for westward immigrants, which passed directly south of the Great Salt Lake. Hastings, however, never traveled the Hastings Cutoff before he published his findings in The Immigrant's Guide to Oregon and California. We're told Hastings did eventually travel his path in 1846 with a rather large group, between 60 to 75 Conestoga wagons. Yet, upon his return to lead a second group from the eastern United States to California in the fall of 1846, Hastings is noted as sending one particular group ahead of the others, giving this group a new set of directions, which ultimately led to their demise. The group I speak of is of course the Donner Party. We're told the alternate route suggested by Hastings caused the Donner Party to be unprepared, as they needed to construct significant new roads to make headway. Ultimately, the Donner Party became snowbound in the Sierra Nevada after falling over a month behind schedule. A significant point of contention amongst the earliest settlers throughout Utah is the Black Rock. No, we're not talking about the Black Rock said to exist at the pole as a significant source of magnetism, which used to be depicted on nearly every ancient map. And no, we're not talking about Black Rock the Investment Group, which seems to control every aspect of major business in our world. The Black Rock we're discussing was first discovered at the Great Salt Lake. However, exactly who discovered it and its exact purpose is still relatively unknown. Those who survived the Donner Party mishaps diligently proclaim to have discovered and named the Black Rock in late 1846, believing the rock to resemble the foundations of an ancient lost tower. Fitz Ludlow describes the formation and I quote, Black Rock rose grim and ugly like the foundations of some ruined tower. We expected a grim and desolate landscape. Never had nature a greater surprise. The view is one of the most charming which could be imagined." End quote. In 1847, upon the arrival of the original Latter-day Saint settlers to the Salt Lake, they also claimed to have discovered and named Black Rock, swimming in the waters next to the rock claiming this occurrence to be the first recorded swimming in the Great Salt Lake in human history. Could this really be true? According to the mainstream narrative, the mountain man Jim Bridger had discovered and explored the Great Salt Lake by as early as 1825. The significance of the year 1776 is also not lost, as we're told the Dominguez Escalante expedition 
conducted by Spain in 1776, saw two priests travel the land surrounding the Great Salt Lake, claiming in all likelihood the Great Salt Lake was well known to travelers from this time forward. The earlier mentioned John C. Fremont surveyed the entire land of the Great Salt Lake by 1843 and again in 1845. However, according to the mainstream scientists, possibly the largest flood in recorded history, confirmed to be at least the second strongest or most powerful flood in human history, occurred directly in the area surrounding the Great Salt Lake. And the resulting flood, which occurred by some estimates only 13,000 years ago, could be the great deluge described in so many creation myths and legends across our Earth. We're told for the last 80,000 years or more, the landscape surrounding the Great Salt Lake was relatively similar to how it is today, with one exception being the time period of roughly 30,000 years ago to roughly 13,000 years ago. During this time period, the last major glacial period, water was said to evaporate at a significantly slower rate. Lake Bonneville, the precursor for the Great Salt Lake, began to rise around 30,000 years ago. As Lake Bonneville had no outlets to the sea, the water within remained relatively unable to cycle through minerals, the water evaporates, and the minerals are left behind, concentrating in the remaining water and making the lake saline. Thus, Lake Bonneville, at its peak, covered much of the state of Utah, as well as parts of Idaho and Nevada, and the lake was a salt lake. Roughly 18,000 years ago, Lake Bonneville reached its peak elevation and actually broke through the basin which contained it, smashing through the Great Rocks at Red Rock Pass. The numbers of the resulting flood are nearly inconceivable. Lake Bonneville at its peak covered 33,000 square miles. When the lake finally broke through at Red Rock Pass, which was considered a sort of natural dam for the lake, the waters released and towered over 410 feet. Yes, 400 feet deep waters rushed forth from Lake Bonneville, quite literally engulfing everything in its path. The flood quickly reached American Falls, which at the time was a lake that was over 40 miles long. The lake immediately eroded away, adding even more fuel to the Great Flood. We're told at the peak of the flood, over 33 million cubic feet of water spilled out per second at speeds of well over 70 miles per hour. We're told thousands of square miles were affected. The flood created a 600 foot deep canyon known as Snake River Canyon and also carved at least two dozen more small to medium sized canyons in the area. The flood also significantly increased the width of Hell's Canyon, which is at least 10 miles wide today. Again, we're going strictly off of the current narrative facts, but according to mainstream academia, the Bonneville Flood, being possibly the largest in history, was accompanied by numerous smaller floods which occurred in unison across the Americas, including, for example, the Missoula Floods, which were said to have been occurring at the same time period as the Bonneville Flood roughly 15,000 years ago. Most of the floods could be considered glacial lake outbursts caused by the receding of the lakes following the last Ice Age period. But what makes this even more remarkable in the general view of the timeline of the Earth, these floods did not happen all that long ago. We have humans, not just proto-humans or an early form of humans, but actual humans, much like me and you, the same development, the same characteristics, who walked, communicated, hunted, built, and lived during the time period of this great flood. Is it so far-fetched to imagine that those who survived these immense flooding events would go on to tell the story? Whether it be from cave paintings or oral tradition, or through the tools and artifacts that they left behind, can we imagine a world where a massive flood event that wiped out most of Northwestern America would not be remembered? Especially if we have humans who actually lived through the event. And furthermore, seeing as these waters swept through the west coast, pulling the flow of almost every major waterway west of the Rocky Mountains towards the Pacific Ocean with gusto, would it be so outlandish to imagine that those who resided in Western America could have been swept to the Pacific Ocean, becoming scattered amongst new lands? Could those who survived the flood of America have landed in coastal China and landed in northern Russia and landed on the Hawaiian coast? 
When the Bible claims that the great flood covered every mountaintop, if the Bible was written by someone who was living in Western America during the Bonneville flood, this could actually fit the narrative. Lake Bonneville, the parent lake to the Great Salt Lake, the location seemingly founded before the narrative really gives it credit, and Lake Bonneville being this destructive force, the flood being one of the largest in history, quite literally shaping the rivers and canyons which the American West is now known for. And then we have the Black Rock, being what some would call an indicator, possibly the evidence of something much earlier, something of biblical origins, which the earliest settlers to the Great Salt Lake may or may not have been aware of. Did the biblical narrative happen in America? I would love to hear your comments down below.